All right, we're going to talk about three um, severe hemorrhagic fever viruses. Um, I think when most people think about hemorrhagic fever viruses, they think about Ebola. That one certainly kind of came up in, um, you know, notoriety after the 2014 epidemic. But actually, prior to that, probably the most commonly um, known uh, hemorrhagic fever virus was actually Lhasa. Um, now, it's not the most common arbovirus. Um, actually, that would be dengue. And dengue certainly can cause hemorrhagic fever, but it does so under specific circumstances, whereas Lhasa is kind of more likely to do so. Um, I'm going to cover Junin and Machupo viruses here as well. Um, they can also cause hemorrhage. Um, they're kind of lesser known. We refer to them um, as the South American um, hemorrhagic fever viruses, whereas Lhasa we most often associate with Africa. All right, so Lhasa as well as um, Junin and Machupo are all Takarib group viruses. Um, that would also include LCMV or lymphocytic choreomeningitis virus. We're actually going to cover that in your brain behavior and cognition block. But um, these three, Junin, Machupo, and Lhasa, um, we're going to cover here. These are all arena viruses. Um, arena is actually the Spanish word for sand. And this group is named this because they're, um, they're actually an enveloped virus. And that envelope actually kind of buds out of the rough ER, so it actually contains um, some of the ribosomes. Now, the ribosomes don't actually do anything to help the virus, but it gives the envelope kind of a pebbled or sandy appearance, so hence the name arena viruses. Um, these viruses are zoonoses, so they are able to uh, infect us as well as other animals. Um, they are not spread by arthropods. They are actually spread by inhalation of dried rodent excrement, um, specifically uh, dried rodent um, uh, urine. Um, you can also get them from bats, so it's not just um, you know, small rodents like uh, mice or rats that we're thinking of. Um, and in those animals, it actually causes like a persistent infection. So those are more reservoirs. Humans are actually a dead end host. We're not really supposed to be part of this life cycle. Um, so we're kind of accidental. And then the virus doesn't go anywhere after it's in us. That's just kind of where it is. Um, so it's associated with inhalation. It's an enveloped virus. Its genome is um, segmented. So you have this ambisense RNA genome. Um, so it's a little interesting in how it is put together structurally. All right, so the arena viruses have kind of an interesting pathogenesis. Um, they're actually able to infect macrophages. That's where they want to be. And in doing so, they actually kind of an induce an inflammatory response. And that's what's going to lead to the immunopathogenesis. Um, so they're actually going to create this inflammatory response by actually inducing the macrophage to produce cytokines. Um, and that can actually lead to a phenomenon known as cytokine storm, which basically you get this intense cytokine release um, particularly interferons. Um, and these interferons basically promote vascular damage. So you're getting um, vascular damage not as a result of the virus infecting endothelial cells, but actually as a result of the virus infecting macrophages. Um, there is also a T-cell mediated immunopathogenic effect, which actually significantly increases the tissue destruction. Um, so disease from an arena virus generally occurs on average about 10 to 14 days following exposure. So that's kind of its incubation period. Um, we expect to see Lhasa in about in West Africa, um, and that's where it's best known to cause um, hemorrhagic fevers. Um, Junin and Machupo, the other members of the Takari group, they cause similar syndromes, but Junin and Machupo, we actually expect to see in like Argentina and Bolivia, respectively. Okay, so they have a slightly different um, endemic area when we're thinking about that. Um, so this is a hemorrhagic fever. So what is it going to cause? Um, we're going to see coagulopathy, fever, petechiae, occasionally visceral hemorrhage, um, liver and spleen necrosis. But remember, not vasculitis, because it's not actually infecting the endothelium. Um, hemorrhage and shock occur, um, and that also occurs with cardiac and liver damage. Um, we don't really see any CNS involvement with loss of virus. Um, 
but you know, you also see lesser symptoms like pharyngitis, diarrhea, vomiting. Um, the vomit will likely be black again. Um, it's a highly fatal illness. 50% um, of patients are likely to succumb to the infection. Um, and even though this one is, you know, spread initially by exposure through um, rodent excrement, because it's also then in the blood, um, it can be spread by contact to medical personnel. So they're at risk for transmission as well. Um, to diagnose it, uh, you're basically just gonna do RT-PCR like most um, RNA viruses. You can do serology, but that won't account for if somebody um, had contracted it earlier. Um, throat specimens can lead, can yield a renovirus, so can urine um, if you want to try to isolate it. Um, when you're handling any of these body fluids, you're gonna wanna use um, level four biocontainment because like I said, it's very, um, it, it's very infectious. Um, so what can we actually do about it? Um, this is actually one of the few ones where we actually can do something. So one, yes, still supportive care, but ribavirin has actually been shown to have some effectiveness against Lassa virus, which is great news. Um, and then you also wanna limit exposure prevention. So limit contact with rodent vectors um, and handle samples from patients very, very carefully.